Okay, so start. Yes. Okay. The stage is all yours. All righty. Wonderful. Well, it's just so great to be here and to see all of you. I wish we were in person together, but one day, um, who knows, maybe next year, or the year after, hopefully that will happen. Um, my name is Heidi Helfand, and I'm going to talk with you today about a topic that I've been going through for 20 years, it seems now, more than that, uh, coaching teams through change. There's a lot of change ha that happens for a variety of reasons to our teams. So let's talk about team change is a topic called dynamic reteaming. So dynamic reteaming refers to team change. I wrote a book about the topic and it was recently published, the second edition by O'Reilly. And I'm really, really proud of the book. And I think there's a lot of ideas about this topic that are overdue for discussion in our industry. So I'm really happy to be able to dig in here and to introduce you to this topic, as well as some concepts that are relatively timely. Uh, my name is Heidi Health and I work at a company called Procore Technologies and we make software for the construction industry. So everything about improving the lives of people in construction, we're trying to uh, connect people to our global platform. We have offices all over the world. And yeah, I, I really thank Procore for being so supportive. I finished this book while working at Procore and uh, had a lot of uh, support and encouragement from our leadership there to pursue this topic to a feeling of completion. And so I guess the other thing to point out is that I'm a practitioner. I work in a software company. I've worked within companies for 20 years. I, I had a stint of consulting in there for a little under a year. But what I really love to do is uh, coach software development teams to get better at what they do and get better while dealing with a lot of moving things, a lot of changes that we must go through in order to thrive as software companies. And my career is also in uh, software as a service. So I've got 20 years in that, working at different startups that grew bigger. <laughs> so yeah, so let's just uh, dig in. So I'm gonna introduce you to something that some of you might be familiar with if you've had any participation in the liberating structures communities, you can see at the bottom of my slides, which, <clears throat> excuse me, by the way, I'll make available after this. <clears throat> this is a metaphor for um, how I like to view teams and organizations as they grow and change. And so it's an eco-cycle metaphor. The metaphor comes from a book called Panarchy and also in part from the liberating structures community. They both use a similar metaphor to explain different concepts, and I like to apply it to teams. But in order to do that, let's take a look at this metaphor in brief first and what it has to do with avocado orchards. So I live in Southern California. I'm in Thousand Oaks, California, and just north of me around the global headquarters for my company, Procore Technologies, we have a lot of avocado orchards. And I think taking a look at what people do to avocado trees uh, provides an interesting opening to this eco-cycle metaphor. So when you first have an avocado tree, it sprouts, you plant a seed and then it sprouts. So it's like the birth phase. If, if the plant, the tree starts to grow, but it doesn't work out very well, it's not thriving. Maybe it's kind of even going to die off. It's akin to what they call in this material poverty trap or a failure to thrive. So it's like something that you're starting that doesn't quite take off. However, let's say it bypasses that and it starts to grow and it moves into like an adolescence phase. And then with more sun, with more water, nutrients, with time, maybe you get a mature avocado tree. And if, you're, if you have an orchard, a group of trees, after a while, the growth can almost become an issue or a challenge. Let's say you have a lot of the trees growing and they're close together, and maybe it's hard for the sun to come through. Maybe the tree isn't growing at its rate of thrive anymore because of lack of sun, maybe lack of nutrients, the canopy is thick. This is what we call a rigidity trap. It's when things kind of, maybe it, there's overgrown or it slows down or some kind of stagnation. 
So then what do you do, right? In some cases, and what they do in, uh, with avocado orchards is they come in and they chop down the trees and then they paint them white so they don't get burnt by the sun and it, it's creative destruction. It's a disruption, in this case, very severe disruption in the trees but what it does is it stimulates renewal. And you can see at the top of this eco cycle, it will start again. And you can see that the tree, the, the roots, or the, not the roots, the, the trunk and the branches of the tree are white, just like the paint, right? From the previous step when it, was, when it had the creative disruption and new growth is starting. So this is the way that they kind of regenerate the avocado orchards to yield more fruit. I coincidentally just ate an avocado before this and I love avocados, maybe you do too. And anyway, so this is an introduction to this kind of eco-cycle concept and the book Panarchy, which is referenced at the bottom here, they use an eco-cycle like this, kind of similar to this, um, but maybe some different words. And it's a metaphor. It's, you know, it's a metaphor that you can apply to different concepts and I apply it to teams. So how do you do that? So if you think of a new team, like a new team in the company, maybe you work at a company or maybe you're a consultant and you work in different companies, sometimes new teams come together. So they're like that, that tiny plant growing. They're in a new phase, the birth phase, right? One by one, people might join the company they might join the team. Maybe they're from within the company, maybe they're from another team. But one by one, your team might grow. And at some point, just like those avocado trees, remember we had the, it was, it was like, it was hard for the sun to get through and other things. We might face a rigidity trap when our teams grow big. Sometimes meetings are longer. I mean, you feel free to post any reactions to this stuff in the, in the Zoom chat. But sometimes meetings get longer. It's harder to make decisions when our teams grow big. Maybe the work becomes unrelated and you're in a stand-up meeting together or you're in a planning meeting together and everything takes longer. And it's almost like some people work on this area, some people work on this area, different sub-specializations kind of come up. It becomes awkward. And I think also we have more work going on in the one team. So overall things just might feel like they take longer and people might wonder like, well, what do we do? What's the solution? So if you, if you think about this, then, well, what could happen? Maybe the team is disrupted. Maybe someone outside the team notices that they don't seem as effective as they used to be. They don't seem to be delivering at the same cadence or why are they in stand-up for 45 minutes? It used to take 10 minutes. Somebody might notice and suggest that the team change or split. The team itself, maybe during a retrospective, the team is empowered to talk about their team composition. How can we become more effective as a team? One of the levers that I encourage teams to pull is thinking about how to change their team composition in order to pursue excellence. So creative destruction here, just like that avocado metaphor with that avocado orchard, maybe somebody decides that the team is split. Ideally, the team is included in this decision. If the team is not included in this decision, you have other problems. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But it's always good to have the inclusion of the team and, and the determination of team change. I think it's respectful. So the structural result, let's say of that big team that splits might be two new teams, right? And I'd put that avocado picture there with that white avocado tree with the new growth at the top. So now you have two new teams. And so that is something that I call a dynamic reteaming pattern and it's the grow and split pattern. So when I was writing my book and I did it over a period of five years, the first edition and second edition, there's also an audio version of the first edition. I interviewed people all around the world about teams and how they change. Cause I thought to myself, well, as, as I said at the beginning of this, I've been in the industry for more than 20 years. And these are things that I've, I've noticed that there's a lot of change. And I've noticed that instead of trying to fight the change, it's better to help the change succeed, especially if we wanna help our companies succeed. Sometimes it's counterproductive to try to stop 
big organizational changes that are happening. And so when I, after I interviewed people, I came up with some patterns that seem to emerge from the interview data. And yeah, so that pattern I just explained was the grow and split pattern. It's something that happens. And I'd love um, to hear any feedback from you. You can enter it in the chat. For example, if you've experienced the grow and split pattern or if you've witnessed it maybe in a different team, is this something that you've noticed? It seems that it's a com more, more common pattern. And there are other patterns too that I'll talk about in a minute, but a variety of team changes can happen simultaneously at different levels. This is the concept of panarchy. They talk about it in Liberating Structures. They talk about it in this wonderful book I've been referencing called Panarchy. But when you have a variety of team changes simultaneously at different levels, I think it can feel, it can feel dynamic. So the essence of dynamic reteaming is this reteaming that is happening maybe at your team level, maybe at your company level, or maybe at your individual level, you decide to switch to another team, for example. So a variety of this stuff can happen at the same time at different levels. And maybe some of us like that. Maybe some of us prefer to have a lot of changing elements around us. And maybe some of us like less of that. I think opinions on these topics really vary by person. And so dynamic reteaming in its essence, here's some dictionary definitions, dynamic of a process or system characterized by constant change, activity or progress. When things are changing at different levels, it feels dynamic. And then reteaming is bringing people together or apart in work or activity. So these are just some uh, dictionary definitions to tie the concepts together. Other patterns, right? So one of the dynamic reteaming patterns that's quite common that we might not even notice because it is so common is the one by one pattern. One person joins a team. So you have an existing team and someone joins it. Maybe someone leaves also. It's the addition of one person or the removal of one person. And your team system is changed whenever someone new joins or whenever someone leaves. It just feels different than it did before. New people bring new ideas, differences, and maybe help us think about things differently than we've ever thought about them before. When you have a lot of one by one addition, it feels like your company is really growing and building because it is. Lately, we've had in the industry, in the world, a lot of one by one leaving of people, layoffs and other things, which I'll touch on later. Not the, the most pleasant topic can be very horrific. Um, but it's all part of this general concept of team change. So I would be remiss not to talk about it. And I, I think in past talks that I've done about this topic, I've really focused more on the growth of companies. Uh, but lately, you know, there's lots of stories collected about uh, the flip side of when people leave teams. And there are things that you can do to make it easier when people add people to teams or when people leave teams. So here's the one by one pattern, grow and split. We've already talked about another pattern of dynamic reteaming. Isolation. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that I've been a part of different startups. The first startup I was part of, our first product was failing. Nobody would buy it. And we had to pivot the company to produce something new. And this pivot really, I, I feel like saved our company. So there were existing teams and some people were invited to join a team to the side and we were given process freedom and we built a product called go to my pc later we invented go to meeting and go to webinar i was part of the original company there and that tactic of starting something new apart from your existing organization just in, in a separate room in a separate location of your building in a separate area and letting the people really determine how they want to work helps them go fast and can help when you pivot. This was all, we did this at this company, it was called Expert City. Again, we, we invented GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar. Really, this pivot really saved the company. And I think you can also use this, I call it the isolation pattern. You can also use this pattern if you have a large enterprise and you want to start a new product. We did that at the second startup I was at at Folio when we started another vertical for our workflow software, we created a team off to the side and gave them process freedom. And this is important, I think, because 
At the first company, for example, we were building in Waterfall, but when we were an isolated team, we did not have to do that. At the second company, we were using Scrum and we were doing two week sprints, but to create a new product, that cycle was too slow for us. We needed to be in invention mode where we were iterating almost hourly, almost daily on concepts. So when you have a mismatch of the work cadence, it's helpful to have an isolated team. There are uh, downsides to all of these patterns. And one of them about isolation is, now the pro is you do have speed. It's good for emergencies if you take a team off to the side. But if you're working on a shared code base with other people and suddenly you have these rogue teams building things that other people have to maintain, you're gonna have conflict. So I think a lot of this takes a lot of careful planning. Getting better at dynamic reteaming is really digging into, well, which pattern are you talking about and how to make that easier? So merging is the flip side of grow and split. Maybe two companies come together and merge. This company acquires another company and they join. What happens with the people when the, when the merging happens at the company level? Teams also merge together. I've noticed a pattern where maybe teams that own certain tools in a company will come together for shared ownership of these tools and then to reteam around different initiatives. I've seen that as a pattern. A lot of these things it's like I'm noticing and people are like, well, is that good or bad? And I think in the spirit of inspecting, adapting and learning, what teams might do is try out a new structure, play it out, reflect on it and tune and adjust. Changing your team composition is again, a lever that you can experiment with in order to pursue excellence. Retrospectives are key. Switching is the last pattern. This is a very humanistic pattern related to maybe, remember the Tuckman's model of team development, forming, storming, norming, performing, implying that the best teams are the ones that stay together the whole time, right? Well, Tuckman forgot a phase in his model called stagnating. When people feel like they've been on a team for too long and they're ready for a change. Maybe you want a change of topic. Maybe you want to work on this other team so you can get refreshed intellectually. Or maybe you want to work with different people, which is completely valid. So the switching pattern is all about switching teams, maybe to pursue fulfillment. It's also a pattern um, that can be used to deliberately spread information around your company using dynamic switching. So there's some stories in my book about that. But this is a basic overview of different dynamic reteaming patterns. Now, another structural change I want to talk about is one that I experienced at a company. And I don't know if you've experienced anything like this before, but I was part of a company and I was on this team. And as you can see on the left side of the team, left side of the screen, um, we are a bunch of directors and we were all reporting to one CTO and we were in this structure for a while. And we had some new leadership come in and then we switched to a structure that was more hierarchical, as you can notice on the right. And for me, this is how the change happened. So through a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings, we were told that we were gonna be in this new structure on the right. And what happened is that some of the peers, we were all together as peers, some of the peers were elevated and became managers. So some of us started reporting to our peers and it was a change that really impacted the team system on the left, if you can imagine. And suddenly we were reteamed into this structure, but it was done through a series of one-on-ones and it was really, really challenging. And for me, I experienced a lot of losses. Like I experienced a loss of access, easy access to the CTO. I experienced a loss of suddenly I wasn't in a Slack group that I was in. <laughs> All of us at the particular company I'm talking about, uh, we, we used that tool, but suddenly I wasn't in those conversations. So I had like this loss of information. And then, you know, there were a lot of questions. I, I noticed that, so one of my peers became my manager and it actually turned out really well for me because he had been one of the best managers that I had ever had. It worked out well for me, but I felt like I felt empathy for my other coworkers because I was like, well, what is it like for this person to have this other person as their new manager? How do they feel? 
And the thing was, we, we weren't talking about this, these changes together. It happened rather like an invisible reteaming. And I really feel like, and I'm going to come back to this story later. Um, one of the things that we did was after some time, we talked about the change and we had a retrospective about this shift from this flat organization to the hierarchical one. And I think talking about the changes, things that we have to leave behind can help us move on to the new future. So besides the patterns of reteaming that I mentioned, those are really base patterns. As I learn more and more about reteaming, I see other things and I experience other things happening, you know, like this one. And um, yeah, I think writing a book is a process of growing and learning. And I would encourage you also, as you're experiencing things in your world, um, to start taking notes and to start writing about them because it, I think all I'm trying to do is understand what's going on. And um, reflection is an important part of that for me. So getting back uh, to the reteaming, as you know, uh, as you might have gleaned from this, Sometimes you're gonna control the change, the team change, or sometimes it's gonna happen. And maybe you didn't want it. Like we don't, we didn't want this global pandemic to start. And this thing caused and introduced a lot of changes in organizations and teams. Sometimes we might be in the position to say, hey, our team feels a little bit big. Maybe we can split into two teams or three teams kind of like that avocado orchard where you're deliberately trying to force the renewal. Other times stuff is gonna happen. It's gonna be out of our control. And I think that as we get along in our careers we need to just expect both things to happen. So, you know, with COVID unprecedented layoffs occurred. There's a link here you can click on um, after this if you wanna to refer to the slides, but company after company economic challenges, asking people to leave the companies and people are in the position to try to find something new. And I think, you know, I have a lot of empathy for this situation. We need to support the people who are looking for new work. And we need to also support the people who stay at the company and witness all of their, or many or some of their coworkers being asked to leave. It's not an easy situation and we have to support both sides and we have to check in with people. Sometimes the people that are left at the company and they witness a grand leaving of many people feel they call it like survivor's guilt. And it's really hard. You got to get it together for your company to kind of move forward, but it's not so easy. And I, my message for leaders when I talk about this stuff is, yeah, you have the old organizational structure and then you have the new one, but it's not so easy to just snap the people in place. We don't automatically adjust to the new situation. In fact, I think there's like a tracer effect with a lot of team change, a lot of dynamic reteaming. And so William Bridges has a wonderful book called Transitions. I reference it at the bottom here, making sense of life changes. And whether it's a COVID related change to teams or whether it's like the one in the bottom right corner of your screen where you know this organization is changing into this one. I think you got to think of the people layer of all of this. So Bridges talks about adjusting or transitioning over to the new beginning. He calls it endings, neutral zone and new beginning. And I've superimposed it on our eco cycle here because I think the, the introduction of a foreign element or a change or whether it's the, the COVID thing, you have creative destruction, which is your team change. And so acknowledging that things have changed, acknowledging the ending is an important part of getting over to the new beginning. The avocado trees, I don't know, do they feel, do they talk about this stuff? That's, that's another topic, but do they experience the endings? <laughs> Um, I think of the, the human aspect here and when I was reorged to that hierarchy, suddenly I wasn't looking in that Slack group each morning. I wasn't part of the standup anymore. It felt so different to me. And I, it took me a while to process that, to move on until I had a conversation with one of the senior leaders in the organization and realized that, wait a minute, how this worked out for me in this new structure, I, also, I actually have an opportunity to make a larger impact than I did 
when I was in that flat structure to the left. And then I was ready. I was up in that birth phase and that new beginning for myself. The neutral zone is, is one thing that uh, Bridges talks about in his book. And it's kind of that, it's almost like a chaos period where people are like processing the ending, getting ready to move forward into renewal, into the new beginning. But, you know, it's, it's, I, that's why I have a jagged line there. It's like, and you don't know where anybody is because all this stuff is invisible, right? If you think of that team that moved over to the new structure until we got together in a room to talk about, well, well what's going on here and what's our new beginning like, it was relatively invisible. Like, for example, where are the people in their acceptance of this change in order to move on? You know, people I have here, Clark, Suzanne, Mira, Raul, they, they're all in different places. Some people are like, okay, the change happened, moving on. Other people, it takes time. They, when people are talking about change, they introduce concepts like grief curves. There's a Kubler-Ross, you know, going through phases of grief. It's not so simple. But I think when, when leaders are planning different changes uh, and they're excited and ready to get to the new structure, just have to remember that it's, a, it's gonna take people at least a couple of months to move forward. But then some people are already moved forward. So talking about where people are, you could use an eco cycle here as a tool uh, to visualize where you are and talk about what you need to do. Yeah, what you wanna bring forward. So let's say the teams are forward. They are in that new beginning. This is, this is some tactical things that I like to do. And you can do it for teams that grow and split, for addition of new people on teams when teams merge and join together, for like new or change teams. These are some of the tactics. And I have a chapter about this in my book, you know, with step-by-step, -step, but also other videos on my website you can watch if you're interested in any of this. So I offer team calibration sessions. I'm in a very dynamic organization now, Procore. We doubled in size since I joined the company. A lot of different changes. So I offer team calibration sessions. And I do, any, I offer any of this stuff for like an hour or an hour and a half maximum. And what I usually do is I'll, I'll hear about a team that has changed. I'll talk with uh, the leaders of the team or the energetic people in the team who might be open to some of my workshops. And then I'll customize an hour, an hour and a half for their team. So what do you calibrate the teams on? So a newly changed or a brand new team or a launch team. There's a wonderful book called Liftoff by Diana Larson and Ainsley Nyes that you can take a look at. This relates to chartering teams as well. But my uh, coworkers name this uh, team calibrations. So sometimes we calibrate on history. If a team is merging together or two companies merging together, doing an activity called story of our team is useful. There's a picture at the bottom here of a team coming together. They made a shared timeline of their history and then key milestones that the team has accomplished. And what this does, especially if you're two companies merging together or te two teams coming together, is it builds a sense of shared history for that new team. And I think it raises positivity and appreciation for past accomplishments. We write on the timeline when people join the team, when people leave the team. But Heidi, we're in a global pandemic. Everything's virtual. How do I do this online? I do this with a shared slide deck and the team can make a timeline using a shared slide deck or you can use a whiteboarding tool. All of this stuff translates uh, to doing it online. I finished my book during COVID, so I have variants for online teaching of these activities. So you might calibrate on history. You might calibrate on the people. If the people don't know each other, there's short activities you can do like Market of Skills from Lisa Atkins. Her book, Coaching Agile Teams is a gem. And it's a sharing of different skills and roles that you bring to the team. Work, you might wanna calibrate on the mission of the team. Why does the team exist? What are we trying to build? What do we wanna accomplish? For many of the teams I work with, this is very clear. So I don't even delve in this area, but sometimes if a team is coming together and they're struggling to find their way, we wanna calibrate on this. Workflow is the last kind of general area that I offer to calibrate on in my teams. It's basically, how does the work flow through our team? What does success look like? We typically 
apply the wonderful methods I learned from Jose Casal at Actinio about uh, Kanban with Scrum kind of tactics and key flow metrics to help a team excel and visualize where they are and how to attain a stable cycle time so they can be predictable. Anyway, highly recommend Jose Casal's workshops on that. So these are the general team calibration areas. Again, I don't get people in a workshop for two days and do everything on this list. It's kind of like, what does this team need in order to iterate a little bit in how they work together so they can just get to work? So some of them wanna recalibrate on these different areas. Team change, I think, can be really, really challenging. And I think for individuals, I have a few recommendations, you know, just as someone who goes through uh, this dynamic reteaming, sometimes I want to do it, sometimes I don't. And I think, again, when you include people in reteaming decisions, you, you might have, uh, it might be easier. Still not easy, I think, even if you have open events where people select their own teams, I think that still can be very scary. I think there's a lot of fear laden in team change. And I, I, it's just a fact, I think. It's just, it's just something that is. But what can you do when you feel particularly triggered? And what I mean by triggered is like, maybe you have to change teams like I did. When I was in that flat organization, suddenly I'm reporting to my peer. At first, like, I was really mad. I was upset. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? Like, really, this is happening? And I was like, if I went to a meeting, maybe... Like I could feel my heart pounding. I think getting to know what it's like when you're triggered and developing some self-awareness is helpful because then you can manage it. So for me, if I'm going through some kind of reorg or some kind of reteaming event and I find it emotionally upsetting, I take the day off. I like to get some space because with time, all of this stuff tends to settle. So, so my advice here is if you're going through a, a challenging reteaming situation, again, none of us chose to have COVID-19 happen. There's a lot of changes that it's like a domino effect from that surprising event. There are changes that I've experienced in teams as a result of that, that I would not have chosen. But what, what am I gonna do? Like we gotta, we're forced to adapt. We gotta move forward. And I think self-care is really important. So getting some distance is important. Talking to people is important. Just recognizing that you're not alone if some of this stuff is challenging. And, but at, at, at some point, we got to look, try to make, get some perspective about the situation, do the best that we can to survive ourselves and to help our companies survive and succeed. So at some point, we got to get, we got to get over that hump, right? And we got to move through this eco cycle, whether we wanted the change or we didn't want the change. We got to get to that new beginning. And I'm not trying to trivialize this stuff. Like it's easy to get to the new beginning. I think it's challenging. And some changes are easier than others. So some people, if you got a big creative destruction, a big dynamic reteaming shift in your teams, sometimes people are going to get through it and move to that new beginning. Sometimes people are going to leave. There's a book called Powerful by Patty McCord. She talks about Netflix. And she was a co-author of this culture deck that was pretty famous for a while about company culture. Patty McCord talks about changes in organizations in which you hire in people for the future of your company. If you've been at any companies that have doubled in size or tripled in size, at some point people ask the question, how do we maintain our culture? Our company feels different. There are so many people now, it feels so different. And some people band together and stay with the company. Maybe they, they still feel fulfilled in the work that they're doing and they have a place to help that company succeed. And sometimes people leave the company and that's a natural thing too, especially as companies have great shifts in size. Some people are gonna leave. You can't retain the same people forever. We wanna retain people in our companies, our wonderful team members, but sometimes it's time for people to leave and they want to. And sometimes they're, they're ready for a new birth phase, but maybe it's at a different company. I think one of the, the key points I alluded to before is let's 
things are going to happen. Get together and talk about what happened in order to shift forward. Apply what you learned from the change and move forward. But after a while, especially changes regarding layoffs, you got to stop talking about the change. If you're still at the company, you got to move on because you got to try to help your company survive. I've had people ask me, well, how long? Like, how long should we talk about it and not talk about it? You're telling me talk about it. And then you're telling me don't talk about it. Well, we can't talk about the same thing forever. You got to move forward and shift to the new beginning at some point. Maybe it's a month, maybe it's two months. You reflect with the people in your planning team, in your organization and decide on kind of what you're gonna, what's the new narrative? How are we gonna band together going forward now? And then after a while, the changes become the past, but it's not easy, it's not trivial. And, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm exploring this stuff. I'm going through different changes in teams as a practitioner in a company, and I like talking about it and writing about it. It helps me process what's going on. So I hope, <laughs> I hope you, you gleaned some uh, useful uh, tidbits from that, that talk, and I'm happy to entertain any questions about this. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. So. so if anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear about them. And I'd also wonder, let's see, how are we doing the question part of this? Um, either people can unmute themselves uh, or if they ask a question, it can be in Spanish and we'll help translating it okay. for you. So you can chat. Um, I have a question, so. How long? No, just kidding. Uh, do you have any like insights of, okay, when that, uh, talking about a, ch a change is like enough? What, what kind of things you perceive by people, by teams that like indicates, okay, now it's time to stop talking about the change, the actual change. Yeah, I think when, when team, like if there's a team and it splits in half, a natural kind of ending happens about talking about the change and they're really the team when invested in the chain really change really just flips into the conversation about moving forward so like the team calibrations well how are we going to manage our work now if we had two teams that are merging into one do we use which jira board do we use for example or how are we going to manage our work when it's this global big change and it's an initiative that impacts maybe hundreds of people, you typically have cross-functional groups that are like um, focused on change management and other things. And I think when that group talks at a regular cadence, they can talk about, all right, what's, where should we focus now? And I think it is after one or two months, which is, is a natural kind of stopping point. But once their work becomes like getting together is not very productive, it's a good signal to stop talking and move forward. And I think if a company has had a departure of many people after a while, these change groups typically focus on helping the people who are there, helping the people who are leaving, doing those types of communication and messaging to the people who are still at the company. But then at some point, a deliberate shift into talking about why, are, why is it important to work at this company? What's important about working at this company? Having a founder come in and give a talk about, this is why we created the company. In organizational relationship systems coaching, we would talk about this as, connecting to the original myth of the company, which is said to raise positivity in a situation or that the story of when you met, it applies to couples too, raises positivity in the situation. So we wanna anchor people to the purpose and the compelling mission of the company as that new beginning. So you wanna shift into that sort of messaging. And I, I, it's, it's after a month or two, I would think. 
but maybe if it's a smaller change, maybe if it's like a change impacting less people, you do it sooner. Talk every week with those planning groups to determine when to shift the message to the more forward looking. Thank you. There is another question on the chat, Heidi. I don't know mm -hmm. if you see it. Yeah, how do you manage change grief on the different levels of an organization? You first work with leadership, then go down. I think it really needs to be simultaneous, um, but I think it's really important to point this out. It, when, you, when you're doing a reorg with a large company, you have to have empathy for the leadership. You have to have empathy for the individual contributors. You have to apply empathy to all of the different levels. And in an ideal situation, you have a coaching organization or part of, a, part of your company which focuses on uh, change and helping people move towards new beginnings and paying attention at all the levels throughout is really important. And I think really fostering this spirit of retrospectives from Agile is key. Talking about the endings, talking about the changes that happened, visualizing the new beginnings, the compelling future. We're all humans together, whether we're in leadership or whether we're uh, part of the team. And so, yeah, visualizing and talking about where you are using a model is, is helpful at all the levels. Maybe use the EcoCycle as a model. Maybe you use one of the kind of like the Kubler-Ross grief curve as a model. Having that as a part of the organizational language is helpful because then if people are in a session one-on-one -on -one or in a group, you can use it as a tool to talk about, well, I'm still here or no, I've moved on. Let's talk about what's next. I'm over here. And you can kind of, you know, you could even, you can do things where I can imagine having like a board, like a, like a whiteboard mural or Miro, one of those shared whiteboards where you have your grief curve or your eco cycle and people can annotate where they are and you can do this as a regular check-in. Thank you. Very helpful. Sure. And so I see some other questions here. What about teams that were never productive? So like, what are you going to do with a team by whatever organizational definition you have, and I think you need one, you have to define what you mean by productive. Um, I think when coaching teams, so, but let's say you have that agreement. Maybe it's that kind of failure to thrive or poverty trap situation. Maybe through retrospectives and other measures, it feels like this team just, the chemistry is not there, it's, it's off. Having a conversation about the team you can re-team at the edges, maybe add someone to the team. What does that dynamic do? You can talk with each of the people in the team. Are they motivated about the work? You can do some assessments and then figure out some sort of re-teaming to try. Next question is, any recommendation regarding how to prepare the team for change so we can make the change itself easier? Very good question including the people in the changes that you're planning is key and including them early as early as you can is also important i think this is an underestimated aspect of team change getting the voice of the people there's a story in my book from christian linwall who is an engineering site lead at spotify san francisco he told me a story of a tribe at spotify that that the tribe grew big and the missions were overlapping and they had to make some kind of change. He and some product managers envisioned a future state. They put it on whiteboards and they had meetings by the whiteboards with people and adjusted their future state based on the input from the engineers doing the work. You can do this using a shared whiteboard if you're all virtual, by the way, but getting to a design that makes sense to the people doing the work is highly important. So I think the key to getting people ready for a change is including them in the change. And there's, there's other tactics uh, in my book about this, but I think that's a visceral kind of suggestion that I have. And I think it's respectful for the people. It doesn't always feel good if somebody's changing, changing, changing our teams, which gets to the next question. What do you think about change fatigue? We've had one big reorg every year for the last two years. Some of them well-managed, but people are tired. Yeah, I mean, 
I'm with you. Like after a while, it's kind of like, it's enough already. Can we just stay in this structure a little bit longer? So I'm not saying change up your teams and do it fast and do it every week. That's not what I'm saying. This book is more of an anthropology that this is, this is how many organizations are. We have these team changes. We need practices to get better at them. That's my point with the book because I'm with you. After a while, sometimes it's like, let me catch my breath. Can I stay in this team a little bit longer? It's a completely valid thing to do. We need feedback loops in our organizations about the rate of change and how the changes are implemented. And so I think if you're in a position in your company where you influence changes, having regular surveys, you can do them quarterly, you can have surveys to people, pulse surveys weekly, you could have fatigue about surveys, but let's say that you do it at a rate that is consumable by people. You need to build in feedback loops, take the temperature of people and see how people are doing. If, you know, after a while, if we don't like it, we're going to leave because there's a lot of opportunities out there in the world uh, for many of the skill sets that we have. So, how are we doing on time? Can I take another one? We are in time, but if you want to take another one, oh, okay. Katie, it's always lovely to hear. Okay. So any advice about how to establish a mission to a team that is created to fix bugs with an almost eternal backlog? Is that a compelling mission that's drawing people to the team? Your mission is to fix bugs only. Some people might be motivated by fixing bugs. There's a, if you, if you Google makers and menders by the company Corgi Bytes, um, uh, M. Scott Ford has a great presentation about uh, what motivates different team members. Are you a maker or are you a mender? Some people are motivated by deleting code, refactoring code. Some people are motivated by fixing a customer problem, working on issues, kind of that sort of emergency room SRE type, type role. Some are motivated by working on brand new features on brand new elements. I think um, shopping the missions around to get input on whether they're interesting or not is something to try. Talking to different team members about whether this mission for this team is gonna be long lived or not. If you put people on a team and they're only fixing bugs and it's not motivating at all to them, I think uh, you might wanna think twice. And uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks for putting these questions in the chat. And yeah, check out Corgi Bytes. They talk about software remodeling and they do remote mob programming and work with different companies to help them iterate their code bases. It's, it's really, really a cool, cool approach. So, um, but I, you know, I, I love talking about this stuff. If any of this was interesting to you, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Heidi. It was great having you here. Thank you. Appreciate the invitation.